Um, obviously, there's some concern about bench testing, but what I am here to do actually is tell you what it can and cannot do. Because I'm fully aware that bench testing does not exactly represent the field, and I try to um, make sure my clients understand that and understand what they can and cannot get out of this bench testing. However, I have been doing it for quite a while. I do feel there is some value in it. Okay, I'm gonna just go ahead and start um, with just a little bit of background about what bench testing is, and then I'm gonna go ahead and explain some of the uh, ways we do our bench test and how we design it, because that will illustrate a lot of the questions that come up with, why can't we do it this way? Why can't you tell me that? And so I'm gonna use actually our typical ISCO bench test to illustrate that. Okay, so what is bench testing? Uh, my definition is, Bench testing is anything you do once you know you have contamination at your site. So you know you've got PC in the groundwater, what do you do now? If you're gonna do some lab work, um, it would be called bench testing. Most of us, the mo thing we're most familiar with is what I call treatability testing. And this is anything from just confirming that a treatment is gonna work. So for example, will sodium uh, for sulfate actually destroy the PCE? If we can just test that. We can compare treatment options. So. Um, if you're looking at types of oxidants, is ozone going to work better? Is persulfate better? Maybe permanganate's the way you want to go. You might want to compare ISCO, in-situ chemical oxidation, versus something reductive like zero-valent iron. Or maybe you even want to compare a chemical treatment and a biological treatment. So should we just add an electron donor to the site? But you could also, um, treatability testing also means just trying to find something that'll work. Um, in this particular case, this was a site where the water was impacted with a lot of organics and also lead. And the theory was the lead was in solution because the organics were com complexing it. So we said, well, how can we get the lead out? Let's try adding some peroxide. Maybe we can oxidize the organic matter and the lead will fall out. We added a bunch of peroxide, got a nice lovely reaction. But as you can see, when we're all said and done, the water is still brown and the lead was still there. So um, it was not effective. We did other things and eventually did find an effective treatment. Okay, but bench testing also includes other things, at least um, in our lab, and that could be uncommon analyses or things that don't have a standard method. So um, uh, soil oxidant demand, for example, measuring of aquatic humic substances is something that shows up in standard methods, but most traditional analytical labs don't want to do it. Bioaccessibility of lead and arsenic in soil. Um, these are also known as PBETs, and you may be familiar with those. But bench testing can also answer site-specific questions. And this is where the custom portion of our work comes in, and it's just whatever you might need at your site. Um, some examples that Prima has done. We had a client wanting to know whether metals would leach from the treated mine tailings, and he did not feel comfortable that the standard DI wet test would be suitable for his site. Um, this was actually one of my very, very first projects when I started Prima. I was uh, able to assist um, with uh, uh, trying to decide whether or not the uh, chrome six at the Presidio was naturally occurring or anthropogenic. I didn't actually make any of the decisions, but I did some of the bench tests that was required, so I kind of, I, I've been dealing with chrome six for a while. So do surfactants interfere with oil and grease? Can DDT naturally attenuate? These are just some questions that we've had. Sources of test procedures, for me, um, sometimes I write them, sometimes my client writes them. I like to have um, input from the regulators to make sure that you guys are comfortable that what we're doing is gonna be of value. I do not want my client spending all his money and then have you guys come back and say, well, that was a stupid way to do it. <laughs> and then they, have to do it all, well, then they have to do it all over again, although I guess I get paid, but I prefer not to happen. And then of course the scientific literature. Who does the bench testing? There are actually options for it. Um, self, I say, usually this means the consultant. Um, so you could get quick, uh, quick results back and make maybe some quick decisions, but most of the time, uh, most consultants don't have the time or the energy or the space to actually do one. Product vendors, um, we're assuming they're reputable product vendors, of course. They usually understand their product very well. So whether it's um, FMC or Adventus with their EHC product, um, they understand what they're doing and they may be able to tweak your um, tweak their product to work well at your site because they understand what's going on and what's important. The disadvantage, of course, is that chances are they're not gonna test anybody else's stuff. Uh, universities, um, they tend to have a wide range of equipment, expertise in terms of professors who've been doing this for a while, and they can be inexpensive because there's graduate, student, graduate students doing the work. 
But um, again, it's an experienced student's doing the work often, and so it may take a little while to get your data back. National labs, again, a wide range of experts. Um, they have a lot of equipment. They might be able to deal with some of the more complicated wastes, especially if there's any radioactivity involved. But it has been my experience that they tend to be, shall we say, on the expensive side, and it takes longer. Um, and in fact, Prima has actually done some work for a national lab because we could do it faster and cheaper. Um, and then, of course, independent labs. This is uh, where Prima falls in. <laughs> unbiased testing, maybe not unbiased marketing. Um, <laughs> um, but we can test many products. Um, and, and again, we test a lot of the ISCO compounds. We test reductants. We test um, electron donors, all kinds of things. Um, we have a relatively quick turnaround time um, compared to you know, your laboratories, or excuse me, a university or something like that. But you know, as much as I want to do this all for free, I can't. And I don't have graduate students working for me, so. Okay, oops. Okay, when should you conduct a bench test? Um, the whole purpose of this is to do it as early in the project as possible. The whole point of the bench test is to give you information so that you can decide what you should do in the field. I have, upon occasion, had a client tell me they're going to go, they need a bench test. Yeah, they're going out in the field in a couple of weeks. I'm like, oh, if you really want to pay for it, I'll do it, but it's not going to help you. But I guess they got to check a box. Okay, so now what I want to do is spend some time just going over how we design our bench tests um, with respect to in situ chemical oxidation. And this is going to hopefully address some of the ways, uh, some of the questions that people have when they say, why can't you do it this way? Why can't you tell me exactly how much reagent we're going to do? Hopefully this will clarify that. Okay, so typical ISCO um, bench test goals usually are measuring the soil oxidant demand. Okay, this is something you need to know because it's not uncommon for the amount of oxidant consumed by the soil to actually control how much oxidant you're going to need at your site. We want to look at COC removal, the contaminant removal. If you cannot get the contaminant to be destroyed in the lab with good mixing and all this sort of thing, your chances of getting it destroyed in the field are really slim because exactly because of heterogeneity and things of this issue. Delivery becomes a, an issue. So if I don't have delivery issues to worry about, can it be destroyed? And we also want to look at destruction versus volatilization if that's appropriate because the point is not to move your contaminant from water into the air. It's to ideally destroy it. A reagent dose, this is an estimate of what we can do, and I'm going to talk about that later. And then secondary parameters, um, it's nice to know in the lab if there's a chance something bad's going to happen. Um, at least you're aware of it. You can have a plan. Oops, I must be doing something else. Okay. You can have a plan B, or maybe you find out, okay, it's so bad in the lab, we're not even going to try it in the field. SOD procedure, this is something that's uh, pretty much everyone kind of agrees on how it's done. You combine your soil, your water, and your oxidant. You measure the residual oxidant at a specified time, and then you calculate your SOD. And SOD is defined as um, the, oops, okay, it's the mass divided, the mass of oxidant consumed divided by the amount of soil you had. This is an example for permanganate. It's echoing a little bit. Um, this is actually an example of very low permanganate demand. Here's your concentration over time, and then when you convert that back into um, SOD. Um, you can see it has a very low demand. This is unusual because permanganate actually doesn't normally stop reacting in the first six hours. Usually you will see some continued um, uh, reaction over time. But this is one extreme. I'll show you another extreme in a minute. There are a few things you want to think about when you're doing SOD. The first is that it can control the amount of um, oxidant you will need, which is why you bother to measure it in the first place. The second is that it's oxidant specific. If I measure the oxidant demand for um, sodium permanganate, I cannot tell you what the oxidant demand is for sodium persulfate. Um, if one is low, the other's probably going to be low, but they're not directly translatable. You, we can measure soil for, excuse me, SOD for acti alkaline activated for sulfate, permanganate, and ozone. We can't really measure it for Fenton's reagent or any of those um, oxidants for which uh, hydrogen peroxide is the basis, and that's because those systems are catalytic and the um, uh, peroxide has a tendency to decompose all by itself even when there's no soil there. And sometimes it's faster in the absence of soil than in the presence, so you can't really even do a control. The soil oxidant demand for unactivated persulfate, um, iron EDTA activation, or peroxide activation may be biased high. 
And the reason for, especially in the laboratory test. And the reason for that is that these products or these compounds will generate acid, and you may or may not have enough buffering in the, in the lab study, and so you will get um, rapid decomposition of the persulfate. And so um, you may not have a, an ideal situation here. And actually, there are times when these things generate acid in the field as well. But the most important thing that SOD does not tell you, and I cannot emphasize this enough, is that SOD does not tell you if your contaminant will be destroyed. I have people that think that's all they need to measure is SOD, and they'll know, but this is a project, um, this is a soil where we added, yes, 76 grams per kilogram of permanganate. That is a really, 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 really big number, and nobody would ever do it in the field, I don't think. Um, it all went away in um, about an hour and a half, and yet, there was no effect on the DDT or toxifying concentration. So this is why it's good to do it in the bench first, because if you had thrown all that stuff in the field um, and then didn't have anything go away, I'm sure you would not be very happy. So um, it is very important to try and confirm that your COCs do actually go away in addition to measuring your SOD. Okay, um, the, how do we assess COC removal and secondary effects? Um, you would think this would be kind of um, straightforward and obvious for uh, something if someone is going to do ISCO, but it's not. You do need soil. Okay, if you have a fractured bedrock, maybe not. But most of the time, we're not dealing with fractured bedrock. We're dealing with soil, and so that is important to include in your bench study. Uh, batch tests are usually better than column tests, and I will go ahead and explain that a little bit more. If COCs are volatile, you need to collect and analyze off gases if they're generated, so you can do a mass balance, and again, make sure it didn't go from point A to point B. Uh, you want to try and maintain a constant headspace. You don't want to be opening your reactor during the test. All of these things could cause loss of contaminants. If you are going to be evaluating sheen or free phase material, which yes, sometimes we do, um, you need to consider how that is going to redistribute in your reactors. And that's important because you need to know how you're going to sample post-treatment. If we're trying to look at did something go away or not, I need to get a representative subsample. And if you've got a layer of goo here, that's not going to be easy to do. And then finally, I prefer destructive, not repetitive sampling. And the reason for that is um, if you open your reactor and start taking things out, you've now changed soil to liquid ratios, you've changed headspace and things like that, and that can just complicate your interpretation later on. How does Prima do our bench tests? It sounds really easy, but if it was, you'd all be doing it in your garages. Um, we basically combine soil, groundwater, and oxidant. Soil to liquid ratio varies, but it's typically in the one to three and one to one to five range, so you have a lot more water than you do soil. The reason for that is there's a lot of analyses you, we need to do, and you need to have enough water to do that without having a big giant reactor. Um, oxidant dose considers COC removal and SOD, and then, of course, we measure the COCs, residual oxidant, and other parameters as, as needed. Dosing, how do we do it? And this is focusing primarily on persulfate and permanganate. You need to know the theoretical dose that you're gonna need just to treat your contaminants, and I recommend including the non-target compounds. Just because um, gasoline is at your site and you don't care about it um, doesn't mean that it's going to be not ex um, exert any oxidant demand. I mean, benzene might be the driver. You write your chemical equation, uh, based on the chemical equation, you can figure out how much, in this case, persulfate is needed to treat um, PCE. So you then can calculate the mass of oxidant you need to treat the contaminants in your reactor. So depending on how much soil and water I have, you also need to calculate the oxidant, made, the oxidant required to meet your soil oxidant demand. You put it all together, and your stoichiometric dose is the mass, not the concentration, but the mass of oxidant you need divided by the liquid volume. And I bring this up because this is the dosing conundrum. This is what happens when everyone says, well, how much do I put in the field? Suppose we have a soil that is impacted with TC or PCE, has this uh, per, uh, persulfate oxygen demand, and we've got water. In the lab, we want to go ahead and treat one gram or one liter of groundwater and 200 grams of soil. If we do all the calculations we discussed on the previous page, it turns out the sodium persulfate concentration should be 0.4 grams per liter. Well, now if we go to the field and we want to treat that same one liter of groundwater, that groundwater is associated with a lot more soil, and you do the calculations and you come up with 6.7 grams per liter. The reason this is very important is because uh, it's very common for an, um, an oxidant to be more effective at a higher concentration. 
Um, I don't even think I've ever tested for sulfate this low before um, in the lab. It just, we, unless you're working with DI water, we don't see a lot happening. So my goal when I'm doing a bench test is to tell you what is the minimum concentration of your oxidant that you need to try and see actually some removal. But this is kind of where the, uh, the conundrum is between translating from the laboratory to the field. But still, if I can get it to work, then at least you know persulfate can work and we can have some idea of what the dosing should be. Um, this is CHP or Fenton's reagent, catalyzed hydrogen peroxide. I don't really want to say much about this other than um, I've traditionally used 1 to 3 percent peroxide in my reactors after it's all diluted with the water just because. Um, higher usually doesn't do any better. If you go higher than that, usually all you do is you get a really cool, exciting reaction. It gets hot, it bubbles, and it makes a big mess. But really all that you end up doing is stripping the um, contaminants from the water. Um, so if you do have a heavily impacted site, there may be times you want to use peroxide or, or Fenton's reagent, but you're probably better off doing multiple doses of a low concentration rather than a single high dose. Analytes, what should we bother to analyze for? Okay. Um, COCs, of course, that's the most obvious. Um, I personally recommend any byproducts. Um, TBA, for example, if you're starting with MTBE. Um, when, when you do ozone, uh, ozone can often generate some TBA. The TBA will eventually go away, but it is a transition. Peroxide alone with no added iron will also uh, convert MTBE to TBA. Um, if you have the iron catalyst in there, though, then you get nice conversion of everything. Parameters that can support COC destruction. So if you have chlorinated solvents at your site in high enough concentrations, it's really nice to be, ever, to be able to measure chloride and demonstrate that, hey, look, we've released some chloride. This means we've you know, destroyed something. We didn't just move it around or didn't get lost. I've done a lot of work to try and make sure my reactors don't leak, but it's always nice to uh, see uh, confirmation of that. Residual oxidant. Um, again, it should be straightforward. I think most people would measure that. But th this kind of information helps you because if for some reason the COC doesn't go away like you expected it to, it's really nice to know that that's maybe the oxidant didn't work as opposed to, oh, all the oxidant went away in the first 10 minutes. Um, and this can sometimes happen with iron activated uh, for sulfate. Oxidant byproducts, uh, sulfate especially, if using for sulfate, is very nice because it confirms that um, when you measure per sulfate, it's just nice to confirm that your um, sulfate went up as expected. Parameters that may be affected by treatment. I think someone asked earlier if there was anything else that was important. Chrome 6 is the main one that I, I recommend with, for oxidants. Um, in California especially, Chrome 6 is, it's not uncommon to see Chrome 6 generation. It does not always go away, at least in the bench testing we do. Often it does, but not always. I personally also like to measure chrom uh, total chromium with that, or I should say dissolved chromium, because if I am telling you that you created chrome 6, I think it's very important that I, I believe that, and so I like to have this to confirm. If you're doing ozone, you may also see bromate generation sometimes, especially if there's a fair amount of bromide in your water. You might want to look for other metals if, you're, if you are expecting pH changes. So if you were doing classical Fenton's reagent, which is acidic, um, if you are doing something other than alkaline activated persulfate, which can also generate acid, you can have metals released, pH and ORP, you just kind of always check for those. And then there may be something site specific that's important. In the past, we used to look for a long list of analytes, pretty much everything, um, alkalinity, um, all the anions, all the metals, and things like that. But over time, we found out that most of those aren't, don't change a whole lot. Okay, batch versus column tests. I'm going to take a couple slides for this. Um, I like batch testing, and the reasons for that are you can get good mixing. Again, as I said, the purpose of the bench test is to tell you if these reagents actually work on your contaminants. They are not designed to tell you whether or not you can deliver them in the field. Uh, batch tests also give you plenty of water to do all the analytical you need. They're generally easier than columns, which makes the client happy because they're a little less expensive, and usually less soil and water. Obviously, the soil to liquid ratio is not the same as in the field. Column tests. Um, the, advantage of the advantages, of course, are that you soil to liquid ratio is what you would have in the field. Effluent concentrations might better represent what you're going to see in the field. However, it is very difficult often to get good flow. It might not be uniform. You're going to have fracturing. Again, 
not good, you're, I don't want to tell you ozone can't work if the problem is delivery, because you have ways to deal with that in the field. Or COCs may be flushed from the column. I had a very nice uh, sand one time loaded with chrome 6. We put one poor volume of water through it, and all the chrome 6 came out at the bottom, So we did, which may have actually helped the client and taught them some things too, but it was not what they were hoping to see. You might need several pore volumes to put through, and it usually takes a lot more soil. Uh, I did want to mention the uh, homogenization, homogenization. If you are going to do a column test, you have to homogenize your soil. I know that there are reasons you might not want to do that. It's not ideal. But if you don't, you don't know what your starting concentration of contaminant is. And if you don't know what your starting concentration of contaminant is, I can't tell you anything. I can't, when you do post-treatment sampling, you don't know if it went away because the treatment was great or if you really didn't have anything to start with. Oops. There are some times, however, when batch test or column tests are actually the best way to go. And the most obvious of that is column testing or beta zone treatment. This is a test here where we ran some columns. We were comparing oxygen, ozone, and nitrogen sparging uh, for treatment in the beta zone, and it actually worked very nicely. We also have some other cases where we've done some column testing. Usually, they're not ISCO-related, though. OK, so what can it tell you? What can it not tell you? Oops. Application of bench tests to the field is semi-quantitative. And what that means is, for contaminant removal, it can tell you if they can be destroyed. If you can get good mixing, if you can get the reagents to the, in contact with the contaminants, yes, it can go away or no. It can tell you about how quickly. Is it going to happen in a few days? Maybe is it going to take a few months? And it can tell you about how much reagent you're going to need. It's not going to be exact. Again, flow paths in the field are going to be a little bit different. But it'll give you a feel for it. It'll give you some place to start. SOD. Lab values that we generate are usually, I have been told, higher than, um, field, than the field. Um, I don't do any field work, but this is what the different injectors tell me. But again, you need a starting point. And most importantly, SOD does not say anything about whether your contaminants will be cleaned up. Secondary effects. This is one I also want to stress. If we see something happen in the lab, so if chrome 6 is generated in the laboratory, what that tells you is your soil has the potential to create chrome 6. It does not mean that it definitely will. Again, there's reasons why that uh, might not happen. But if we see it in the lab, you should be aware, and you, know, you can make plans accordingly. Um, however, if we don't see it in the lab, if we've done really good mixing, if we've used a really high concentration of contaminant or oxidant, and we still can't create chrome 6, chances are you're probably not going to see it in the field either. Okay, and then the magnitude, um, this is also something I want to point out. The magnitude that you see in the field could be different than you see in the lab. If I measure you know, 31 milligram or micrograms per liter of chrome 6 generated in a laboratory, that doesn't mean you're going to see 31 micrograms per liter in the field. It just means that your soil has the potential to generate chrome 6. Uh -oh. OK, I guess that's where I want to be anyway. OK, so just in conclusion, bench testing is what you do once you know the concentration of your contaminants. It provides guidance for field activities, but it does not replicate the field conditions. And it must be properly designed, conducted, and interpreted to be of any value or any meaning. And with that, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Um, I, I have a question, actually. Sure. Um, is there any way uh, that you can kind of front load the results of what's going to happen with Chrome 6? I mean, can you, can you take a look at analytical data that was done in the field? No. <laughs> so there's no, no correlations that, that you've seen, really. The, the question was, is there any way to predict, I, I believe, whether or not chrome 6 will be formed? Is that, that it sort yeah. of? Yeah, more or less. <laughs> um, well, I, I guess that's not entirely true. Unfortunately, we're not aware of any direct correlation between the concentration of, chrome, of total chromium in your soil and whether or not chrome 6 will form. If you happen to be in an area that has a lot of serpentinite soils, Probably you're going to make chrome 6. That's just, it seems to be more of the mineral, uh, the mineral phase of, of the chromium. If you've been at a site that has chrome, chrome at it because of anthropogenic material or anthropogenic activities, maybe all that chrome 6 you know, from your plating shop has now been converted to chrome 3. But I would suspect that those chrome 3 hydroxides might be more susceptible to oxidation than, say, naturally occurring chromium. But um, 
I'm not sure off the top of my head whether there's any, actually people have asked a lot, but I'm not sure there's any way to really predict whether or not chromium will be generated. Yes? You know, I was somewhat surprised by finding out how much bin scale testing costs. I always, I always try to get some sense of how much money is yes. being spent. Maybe you could tell them a little bit, you know, if you're doing ISCO and let's say you want to test, you know, per sulfate and um, uh, peroxide as a couple of different options and people bring you their soil and they say, we want to know, we want to know whether chrome six is likely to be formed. We want to know what the dosing is. We want to know what the chemical oxygen demand of the soil is. So, how much money is that roughly going to cost those people to get that done? Right. Um, well, okay. Um, if the, the typical um, uh, oxidant or ISCO bench test, which was the goals that we I had showed up there, so SOD, contaminant removal, um, and um, secondary effects, that sort of thing, they run anywhere from like 7,500 to 15,000. If you want to start comparing a whole bunch of things, I have actually performed a bench test that cost 160,000. Um, that was a very complicated, very in-depth, multiple soils and things like that. Um, now, what I do want to stress, though, is I don't want to, I mean, in a sense, I'm defending my cost, but this is premium cost. I mean, other, if you go to a product vendor, they might be able to do it for free for you. I mean, they're going to make their money selling you their products, so they can do their, the bench testing for less. We are in an independent lab. This is what we do. I don't sell product. We don't go out into the field and do any injections. So we try and be thorough. Um, we also do try and work with you to um, meet your goals. So, um, you know, if, if you have a smaller budget, we can look and see what we do, what, what we can do, and what, what questions are most important. Um, if, you, if you have TC and that's your only contaminant, um, you could probably get away with just doing an SOD for permanganate. That's the one um, time I will tell you that uh, SOD is probably okay. And that's because if permanganate doesn't react with TCE, there's something really weird happening at your site. So, that's just very. All right, probably time for one more question. Uh, I'm Sri Iyer with the USD Cleanup Fund. I just wanted to find out how much do you get for the $7,500 you mentioned, basically? How many samples are we talking about? Well, usually what we're looking at is one um, soil water. You're looking at um, a couple of different doses of two or three doses of your oxidant. You're looking at the soil oxidant demand. Um, if you're looking for ozone, excuse me, for Fenton's reagent, we actually don't do um, a soil oxidant demand. We do a longevity test, so you get a feel for how long the peroxide is going to last in the field. And we get, um, let's see, well, um, secondary effects. Some of the costs depend on what your analyte list is, too. So if your analyte list is smaller, costs go down. If you have the analyte list where you know your contaminants, you need to look at SVOCs and you need to look at um, everything under the sun in terms of secondary effects and, you know, costs can go up too. But um, we try and, um, again, it just, it takes time to do it. It takes time to do it well. Thank you. 